delivering his lecture based upon his expertise on the modeling of fracture and uh, failure and fracture in soft materials okay so for audience uh, uh, you can post your questions through q and a uh, box and at the end i will relay these questions to professor volok so i welcome professor volok again and it's over to you uh, costa now okay thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to deliver this talk i will talk about modeling failure in fracture and soft materials and primarily since uh, fracture is considered brittle or ductile i will talk about brittle fracture the, although i consider soft materials which usually undergo large deformations but nevertheless there is almost no plastic deformation inelastic deformation so it is essentially brittle fracture uh, well fracture is arguably the central problem in solid mechanics and mechanics of materials and uh, in my very humble opinion it is still unsolved unsolved problem so i will talk a little bit about uh, uh, our group strategies uh, and results how to model how to model uh, failure in fracture in soft materials and uh, this topic is uh, was uh, considered for the first time 100 years ago so it is uh, we passed one century since this first uh, paper by alan griffith to him i would like to pay tribute uh, he formulated this first theory of brittle fracture in this uh, famous paper phenomenon of rupture and flow in solids and um, this paper was very important actually it is the very basis for the subsequent developments and especially for the so-called uh, linear fracture mechanics. That is the basis and the basis for the generalizations. So since the paper is very important, I would like to show you the main result. The paper itself is very lengthy, although I would advise looking at it and reading it. But here is the main result. What Griffith did actually, he considered an elliptic crack uh, in the plane loading under hydrostatic tension. And the solution for this, for this problem was, uh, uh, was obtained by Inglis before Griffith. But what Griffith did, he considered global energy balance and he found the critical pressure, the critical pressure under which the crack uh, becomes unstable. Okay, so, so it's a critical tension, uh, the critical load, critical hydrostatic tension. And this, I use here the modern notation. So the critical tension is equal, is equal to the fracture toughness, which is a material parameter, divided by uh, the square root of pi a. A is the length of the crack. So this is how we know this formula today. But actually what Griffith did, he, did, he derived this formula, this formula. Uh, it, is, it is different from this one, okay, because here, we have b over a with where b b uh, over a is the sharpness of the crack okay b is the thickness of the crack and a is the length of the crack so dividing this ratio gives us the sharpness but what is interesting here is mathematically uh this term is very small as compared to one and this term is very small as compared to one so computationally computational, this critical tension doesn't depend on the crack sharpness. Well, in Griffith theory, critical tension doesn't depend on the crack sharpness. It happened because the theory is based on the global energy balance, which smears the stress and strain concentration at the tip of, the, of a real crack. And this result is very important because it says whatever the crack is, whatever the tip of the crack, will always have the same critical tension. But when people do experiments, critical tension depends on the crack sharpness. It significantly depends on the crack sharpness. And this explains why the calibration of fracture toughness is so difficult. I would say it is impossible because uh, your result depends on what crack tip you have in your experiments. Okay. Um, 
nevertheless, it was the first work. I don't know why it is still so popular and this result is so widely used. Actually, it directly contradicts experiments. Uh, but nevertheless, it was the first paper in this direction, in, in direction of fracture mechanics. And uh, it is important that cracks were explicitly considered in this paper. And uh, before I, I go to, uh, to what I would like to tell you uh, in this talk about the uh, approaches to the modeling, which we try to develop, I have to do uh, to make some conceptual remark. Uh, both the fracture mechanics and strength of materials approaches, they impose separate failure criteria on the stress and strains obtained in analysis of intact materials. So we do stress analysis, and then based on the results, we decide if everything is okay or we have a danger of failure. I think this concept, this conceptual approach is not very good in principle. I think that failing fracture should be incorporated in the constitutive description of materials and crack initiation and propagation should be an outcome of the solution of the clearly formulated initial boundary value problems. Okay, and this is the direction of my talk. Uh, the outline. Here I have to distinguish between two terms, failure and fracture. By failure, I mean the onset of damage. The onset of damage, but not its localization. Its localization and propagation, I call fracture. So simply speaking, fracture is a crack, propagating crack. Failure is the only the onset of the crack, the onset of fracture. So considering failure, I will introduce the energy, the concept of energy limiters, and I will consider three applications, the problem of cavitation and soft solid strength of soft composites and prediction of the crack direction. Uh, concerning fracture, I will generalize the approach of energy limiters to the material sink approach. And I will show you some results of the crack propagation simulations. Um, of course, my, uh, all my talk will be about modeling. I will show also some experimental data and uh, some experimental movies. But before I jump to equations, I would like to describe verbally the essence of my talk and the essence of the results. So I would divide everything into application, into physics and mathematics, okay? I think it, the separation of these points is important actually. So if we start from the bottom, what is the physics of modeling failure in fracture? So again, here I divide, on the left is failure and on the right is fracture. So the physical basis for modeling failure is the fact that the energy of the molecular or atomic bonds is bounded. The bounded energy allows to introduce on the mathematical level, the energy limiters. And this allows considering various applications, various problems involved involving failure as the onset of damage. When we consider fracture cracks, then we have take into account or assume that the broken bones are diffused. They are not attached to a surface. They are diffused. And if they are diffused, they lead to the material sink, highly localized material sink on the mathematical level. And of course, this formulation allows considering running cracks. And I will also show you some results of this simulation. So it's important here to emphasize that we don't introduce, I will not introduce any internal variables. These physical assumptions are enough for the math, which allows considering these applications, which are key applications, the only applications maybe of interest. So let's start with the energy limiters. And uh, this is a physical part and um, qualitatively, 
uh, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that when we consider two particles, elementary particles, then there is an interaction between them. And here you can see this interaction depending on the distance and the forces develop in this interaction, they also depend on the distance. On the left-hand side, you can see the energy dependence on the distance. And you can see here actually uh, three areas of repulsion, attraction, and separation. During the separation, the energy approaches the energy limit, okay, which is called in chemistry the bond energy. So we have the energy limit. If we differentiate the energy with respect to distance, then we get the force distance diagram. And you can see here that we have the limit point. This limit point is due to this energy limit. Okay, this, uh, the area under this curve is limited. So we have the energy limit. Well, it's not surprising at all. And in physics, it's a commonplace. But in the case of bulk material, with billions and trillions of atoms. The situation is subtler. But again, we can, we can use, we can use uh, this reasoning also in the case of, bulk, of the bulk material. Number of physical particles in the representative volume is limited. So bond energy of this particle is also limited. And the strain energy on the macroscopic level should also be limited the limited strain energy automatically provides limited stress. And here on these diagrams, you can see again qualitatively the results of this reasoning. So now we have energy versus strain, not the interatomic distance. So strain is essentially the average of the change in interatomic distance. It's a measure. It's a measure of the change in distance. So if we don't have any failure, then we have this diagram. If we have failure, then energy always approaches some limit. Okay, I call it phi. And this is the energy limiter. If we have the energy limiter in blue, then on the stress strain diagram, which is again the derivative of the energy with respect to strain, we have such curve. We have the limit point. The stress is limited. The stress is limited. And um, uh, this is the way to describe material instability. Material instability is the onset of damage, which further localizes into crack. Now let's go to mathematics. How to introduce the limiter? Well, it's a general question, and I'm sure there are various ways to do that. Uh, my proposal is to use the strain energy in this presented form here, the uh, psi is the strain energy, F is the deformation gradient, phi is the energy limiter, uh, this is the identity tensor, and you can see here gamma function, this is incomplete upper gamma function, uh, which depends on W, and W is the energy without failure. This is a classical hyperelastic energy. Okay, so when we introduce in this form by using gamma function, we introduce the limiter. Well, it's not obvious from here, of course, but it is much, uh, much more obvious when you consider the constitutive law. If you differentiate the strain energy with respect to the deformation gradient, you get the constitutive law. And this is the first purely curve of stress. Look, it, it looks like the, like the usual conservative law. We only have this exponential term. We have this exponential term, which limits, which limits stresses. It comes from this gamma function, but we already got rid of the gamma function in this equation. Okay, so it's not that scary to use the gamma function. I go immediately to an example of the calibration, experimental calibration of the uh, strain energy with a, with a limiter. And I consider the case of natural rubber. In the case of the natural rubber, this is the intact uh, strain energy for the intact material behavior. This type of material is called yield material. Okay, it has three terms. It depends on, only on the first principle invariant. We have five material constants, including the energy limiter, and this, these two material constants are regular. 
and m is an additional constant of failure. If m equals 10, then we have a very abrupt failure. If m equals one, then we have a very gradual, very gradual uh, failure. Sometimes it is important, but in many cases, it's enough to assume m equals 10. So we only need to calibrate in the Taylor experiments, the energy limiter. And here I show you an example of it, such calibration based on the experimental data from Hamdi. Okay, so they considered uh, the loading uh, until failure of various specimen under various conditions in tension, biaxial, equibiaxial, uh, uniaxial, and with uh, various ratios of stretches. Uh, you can see here the stress, this is Cauchy stress, and this is a stretch. Uh, this is a stress stretch diagram. The dashed line without failure, uh, the red line with failure, with failure. So at this point, at this stretch, it's approximately 7.1. Okay, we have material failure. And we calibrated at this point, we found this energy limiter, which provides material failure, okay? And then we used this calibrated material model uh, and uh, compared this, uh, the experimental results to the theoretical failure envelope under various uh, biaxial uh, stretch ratios. So you can see here these uh, red triangles are for experiment and these uh, blue stars are for the theory it's quite encouraging. So I will use this model, this calibrated model in subsequent uh, simulations. Okay, sometimes I will, I will tell you, sometimes I, I mean it. Um, let's go now, so that, that's all, that's simple. So we only have to calibrate the energy limiter. Okay, and we have the strain energy function. It is quite universal. So we can substitute any uh, intact material energy. Okay, so let us consider, first of all, uh, the problem of cavitation. And cavitation is an unstable expansion of microvoids. Uh, this is a picture. So we have a very thick wall sphere. Okay, and A, this is the radius of the small cavity or small void. Uh, and this is the radius, the external radius. So, Actually, in essence, this uh, hydrostatic tension is on infinity. Okay, so it is very remote. Uh, this problem was uh, considered for the first time in the experiments by Janet and Lindley. And uh, this is a mode of failure in soft materials, uh, the development of cavities or cavitation. Uh, in this paper, also a fam very famous paper, internal rupture of bonded rubber cylinders in tension. Uh, so Alan Gent and Lindley, uh, they did experiment and they also interpreted this experiment. The experiment is very interesting. They used, as you can see, rubber cylinder, but actually the cylinder was in the form of a pocket chip. Okay, so this is the experiment. This is the rubber cylinder. So it is very thin. It is very thin. Yeah, it is glued to this disc, uh, discs and uh, put under tension. It is very thin in order to get the hydrostatic tension, the state of the hydrostatic tension. So it's not a uniaxial tension state. It's a hydrostatic tension essentially because it is very thin, the pocket chip. And what they did, they loaded it and then they cut it in the middle uh, across this uh, plane AA. And this is what they observed. You can see here, a lot of cavities, they are visible. Of course, initially in the specimen, you couldn't see any cavity, okay? But now all these cavities are visible. They are large, they are large. And it is also interesting that when we cut it, yeah, we unload it. So uh, you can't close these cavities. They are not closed, they remain as is. So in order to explain this very interesting result, Jen proposed to use the following theory. And again, I separate mathematics from physics, okay? So let's start with the mathematical part and I use modern terms, of course. So this is the uh, remote tension, hydrostatic tension. It depends 
there is an integral, so it's a semi-analytical solution. Uh, Psi again is the strain energy. Lambda is the hoop stretch and lambda A is the hoop stretch at the edge of the cavity. Okay, so we can track how the stretch of the radius of the cavity changes and how it affects the critical, oh, the, the tension. Specifically, Gent assumed that the strain energy is the new hooking strain energy. And mu here <coughs> is the shear modulus in the new hooking model. And he found, he found a very simple formula. Actually, not he found, it was known before. It's already green in the book. By green, it was already published that the critical, the critical tension where the integral converges is equal to five over two mu. This is the critical hydrostatic tension. Okay, so this is the machinery, the mathematical part. What is about, what is the physics behind this calculation? So there are three assumptions here. First of all, that cavitation is a purely elastic phenomenon. So we can use this hyperelastic uh, material model. Second, that the new hooking material model is applicable to analysis of large stretches. And the third, he also assumed that the critical tension is universal for all materials with the given initial shear modulus mu. Okay, so these are essential three assumptions. They, again, they are in use until today. Well, while the uh, gen experiments are unquestionable and uh, people uh, repeat, uh, repeat uh, these experiments, it is repeatable. The Jens theory, Jens interpretation is much more questionable on every point, on every physical assumption. First of all, if cavitation phenomenon was purely elastic, then we wouldn't observe uh, it after unloading while we do observe it. Second, Neil Hookian model is only relevant for stretches not exceeding values of 1.2, maybe 1.3. While the critical hydrostatic tension is achieved for much greater stretches. And the third, the integral converges to the critical tension for the new hooking material model, while it doesn't converge for more realistic material model, which can describe large stretches. Well, the problem here is that very special choice of the material model allowed, uh, and quite ironically, allowed Jen to, to give the explanation, to find the critical tension. But actually, if you can see the various material models, you don't have any critical tension. And here on, this, uh, on these diagrams, two diagrams, we considered in this paper, we analyzed uh, convergence converges of the, um, of the tension, hydrostatic tension for various material models. Actually, I took only six material models, but we, we examined uh, much more models. Here, the Biderman, Yale, Fleming, Isihara, Ogden, Gent, Aruda Boyce models. You can see here the uh, tension versus the radius or, <coughs> or the hoop stretch. And this dashed line, they show how the models behave in the case of uh, cavity expansion. So we don't have any limit. We don't have any limit. So we don't have any cavitation phenomena. You cannot explain cavitation by using the intact material models. But if you introduce the energy limiter, then you always have this limiting, this limiting uh, asymptotic solution. Okay, so it's essentially damage phenomena. Specifically, you can see here, we use this calibrated natural rubber model, assuming that the material used by Gent and Lindley is more or less natural rubber. Of course, they, all these uh, rubbers are different natural rubber, but more or less close in the uh, mechanical properties. So this is the theoretical prediction, and this is the, what they, they got in the experiment. It's, uh, also, it's quite, it's a little bit different, but quite encouraging. So uh, let me summarize. Cavitation is a damage phenomenon. It's not an elastic phenomenon. 
and it cannot be described without theories incorporating damage. Okay, so when you consider cavitation, you should take it into attention. Let's go to the next application. This is the strength of soft composites and uh, um, natural biocomposites are soft composites, uh, shell, teeth, bone, antler. They have in common the staggered material architecture. It means we have the soft protein matrix in red here, and we have mineral platelets, which are much stiffer than the protein matrix. This is called the target material architecture. It is interesting that uh, this architecture provides high stiffness, strength, and fracture toughness. This is what was observed in experiments. And this talk, I will, I will talk about strength only and the stiffness a little bit. I will not talk about fracture toughness it, because fracture toughness requires propagation of cracks. Okay, we work on that, but we don't have the results yet. So I will talk about the strength only, the onset, the onset of damage. And our idea was just to take, to take an example, simulate it, do experiment, and to see what was the reason for, uh, for the high strength of such uh, materials with staggered architecture. Maybe we can use this architecture in man-made materials and we'll solve problem of high strength materials. Um, this is the strength of every separate component of the composite for shell and bone. So this is the strength of the protein matrix. It is the, it is same for, for both and for the mineral platelets. But for the composite uh, as a whole, we have very high overall strength. So it looks like the theory of the weakest link doesn't work here. Look, this is the weakest link, but the strength of the, of the whole composite is much higher. Overall strength is five, 10 times the strength of the soft matrix. Is the high strength due to the target architecture? So we did calculations and uh, I will go into the technicalities, uh, you can find them in this, uh, in this paper. We use the high fidelity generalized method of cells uh, for the homogenization. And um, for the matrix, for the soft matrix, we, usually, uh, we use the model that I described previously. It was essentially the natural rubber model. And for the platelets, we use much stiffer material and the model doesn't matter in this case. Specifically, we use the San Benan material model, uh, Kirchhoff San Benan material model, which allows considering large rotations. Um, let me show you results of the simulation. So we consider, again, we don't propagate tracks, okay? We only consider strength. Strength, it means you load in uniaxial tension and you track the stress particularly uh, this is Cauchy stress against stretch in uniaxial tension. So you load uh, quasi statically and you arrive at a point, start points of the strength where the static solution doesn't exist beyond this point. So this is the strength by definition. And we considered four cases. This is the perfect composite. In this composite, we put cracks, we pre-crack it, okay? These white areas without material, without any material. Then we increased all edges of the platelets were without contact between them. And we also added horizontal pre-cracks in the fourth case. Okay, and you can see here the stretch, uh, the stretch uh, uh, stress curves for any, for all cases. It is amazing and maybe counterintuitive that the increase of the pre-cracking leads to the increase of the strength. Okay, so both these cases, they have greater strength than the perfect, for example, or slightly cracked uh, case. 
it was uh, it was uh, counterintuitive, so we wanted to check it in in experiments, and we did experiment. This is the uh, printed composite. It's not exactly the matrix is not exactly the uh, natural rubber. It's a very special material. I, I don't go uh, into details, but if you are interested, you can find it in this paper. And uh, we loaded in uh, in uh, simple uniaxial tension. In uniaxial tension. Uh, let us see if we can. Okay, uh, let's see the movie. So this is a typical case uh, of the loading. Now, pl please uh, pay attention to this. You, you, you can see here the opening. At the edges, we have the opening. Cracks develop until some point of rupture. Okay. So we track uh, stresses, stresses again. These were Cauchy stresses versus stretch. And here you can see this diagram, this diagram. Uh, and uh, you can see also the snapshots uh, of, the, uh, of the specimen. It's not necessarily the same specimen as in the movie. But what is important here, look, again, this is a perfect composite and it, its strength, but we can go higher with this strength, okay? So this is a composite where we have the opening at the edges. So the strength is higher here. So it is quite amazing. Uh, qualitatively, we have the same result as it was predicted in the calculations. So brief discussion of the result. First of all, the increase of the density of inclusions lead to the stiffness increase. Well, that is clear, uh, intuitively clear. Uh, it's, there is no doubt about that. The strength does not necessarily increase. It is affected by the locally non-uniform state of deformation. Look, this is important. People quite often, they don't distinguish between stiffness and strength, but these two concepts are completely different. I mean, by increasing stiffness, you can automatically increase the strength. Okay, and this is what we observed. And this is what we observed. Uh, deleting soft material in some areas, it is possible to increase about four times the strength. So pre-existing cracks, they relieve the stress and strain concentrators, providing greater material resistance. This is also, we can predict it before we did uh, simulations and uh, experiments. That was quite interesting. Now, if I return to the biocomposites, then I can draw these conclusions. High strength of biocomposites may not be just due to the staggered architecture, but rather due to new bonds created at the nanoscale. Indeed, indeed, the soft matrix is the weakest link in the composite. No doubt about that. So the fact that uh, natural biocomposites, they don't have the protein matrix as a, as a weakest link, it says that something happened, some new material is produced in, in the biocomposites. So biocomposites might not be composites in the regular sense, but rather, they might be essentially new materials with special new properties. And of course, methods of the classical continuum mechanics should interpret the information from these different length scales for proper elucidation of the remarkable mechanical properties of, the, of biocomposites. <clears throat> okay, let's move to the, uh, to the crack direction. Let's try to define crack directions without having cracks. That's the idea. How to do that? <clears throat> if material is intact, it can propagate waves. Okay, we deform material, but it still can propagate waves. So we can consider local waves superposed on the deformation. We can consider specifically superposed plate waves. 
And this is the description of the superposed plane waves. Why, why uh, tilt is the superposed plane wave? Uh, why is placement, why tilt, uh, the placement increment T is time, R is the unit vector of the direction of wave polarization, and S the unit vector in the direction of uh, wave propagation, and V is the wave speed. So we consider the plane wave superposed on the deformation. Can it propagate? If material is intact, the answer is yes. But if material has damage in the form of crack, it cannot propagate a superposed wave in the direction perpendicular to the crack. So that's the idea how to identify the direction of the crack. Let's find the direction in which superposed plane wave cannot propagate. So let me summarize this. Zero wave speed means the loss of the strong ellipticity and inability of material to propagate wave in direction S, which can also be interpreted as the onset of a crack perpendicular to S. Mathematical formulation of this condition is very simple. It's one scalar equation. Okay, so this is the equation for the squared wave speed. It depends, it depends on the direction of the wave polarization, uh, direction of the wave itself, and the deformation, uh, the initial deformation. It can be calculated and it should be equated to zero. So we should analyze the scalar equation, scalar equation, and we, should, we can find the direction in which waves cannot propagate. Specifically, we consider uh, shear, shear and pressure waves in all cases. So let me show you the first illustration is very interesting. It's a rubber bearing. Okay, uh, uh, during the great East Japan earthquake in 2011, okay, they, they put in Japan, they, they put uh, the rubber bearing here at this, this is the location of the rubber bearing, and this is the rubber bearing. And during this uh, earthquake, first of all, these bearings, they helped, but they were cracked. Please look at this. This is a clear, very nice horizontal crack. Also here you can see, okay? <clears throat> so we can see that in this paper with polylometer varuni, uh, we consider it we try to predict the direction of the crack in the rubber bearing. And we considered simultaneously compression and shear under large deformations, finite strains, okay? And we, we also found that the cracks should be horizontal. So we could predict the horizontal cracks. Actually, this is very interesting because if you can predict uh, the crack direction, you can also think about reinforcement. Okay, how to reinforce this material, how to make a composite of it. But that was the next step that we didn't consider in our research. We, we only did analysis. <clears throat> Another example that we did with Varuni is much more dramatic. It was the crack in the direction of tension. And what we did, we considered a rubber band, okay, rubber band and uniaxial tension. And we tried to find the direction of cracks. We found that there are cracks in the direction perpendicular to stretching, which is absolutely reasonable, okay? This is what we expect generally. But also, we found that there are cracks in, in the direction parallel to stretching. That was completely unexpected. Now look, uh, we tried for, for, for quite a long, when Varuni uh, obtained this result, I couldn't believe, <laughs> I told her that something uh, went wrong. <laughs> so she, for a month, she tried to find an error in calculations and she couldn't. And then I tried for a month and I couldn't. And we sent the paper with this result to General Applied Mechanics. Okay, it was published here. Uh, so 
look, sometimes equations, the mathematical equations, they, they give you more than you expect, okay? And some results might be unreasonable and they should be sorted out. So that's the way we thought about these cracks in the direction of tension. But when, when the paper was already uh, under review in the Journal of Applied Mechanics, we found a very interesting experimental result. We found this paper in, in proceedings of the National Academy of Science, sideways and stable crack propagation in silicon elastomer. And these two guys observed cracks in the direction of tension. Okay, so this is the specimen. This is the crack. This is the crack. Okay, you can see it here. It is amazing. They found cracks in the direction of tension. Exactly what we found in our theoretical analysis without knowing that. <laughs> so it was a great relief. <laughs> you know, some, they say equations are smarter than us. <laughs> so that was definitely the case. Um, yeah, so there are, there are uh, cracks, they might be cracks in the direction of tension. So a uh, consideration of the zero speed superposed plane waves helps to predict the direction of damage localization into cracks. The incompressibility constraint that is very often used for soft materials can turn into the into a Trojan horse in the analytical calculations and uh, its use should be careful. Well, what we found that the incompressibility condition suppresses pressure waves, but pressure waves are important for the prediction of cracks. Okay, so when you use the incompressibility condition, you should think twice and don't use it. Cracks in direction of tension are predicted theoretically and they were observed experimentally. Yeah, to our great surprise too. We were shocked actually. And now I go to the crack propagation to fracture itself. Um, and the, the key question is here is what is crack? <laughs> it, it sounds simple, but the answer is not simple. It's not simple. People usually think about crack as a separation of two adjacent atomic layers. Okay, so usually this is on the distance of one angstrom. It might be nanometer also, or between angstrom and nanometer if you wish, but uh, this is a typical interatomic distance. So people think that this is such peaceful unzipping of two adjacent atomic layers, okay? This assumption is appealing intuitively, okay? Because it is a simple assumption, very simple assumption. We have interatomic layer, which separates, reasonable. Well, not so fast, not so fast. The smallest size of the object recognizable by the naked eye is about 60 microns. If crack was a separation of two adjacent atomic layers, then we wouldn't see it, the close crack. We wouldn't see it, but we do see cracks. Okay, look at this very nice crack in the unloaded tire. Okay, if it was the interatomic distance, we wouldn't see it at all, but we see it. <clears throat> Why is that so? The bulk crack appears as a result of the development of multiple micro cracks triggered by the massive breakage of molecular or atomic bonds. The bond breakage is not confined to two adjacent molecular layers and the process involves thousands of layers within an area of volume with a representative characteristic size L, okay? Well, in the case, so if, so if we have many broken bones, then we have material sink. We should have debris, debris in polymers. We can, we can see the debris, that's true because of the structure of polymers <clears throat> and most soft materials. But if you look at another brittle material, say concrete, then cracking in concrete is always accompanied by the concrete dust. And you can see dust. You can even see small pieces of concrete. So definitely we lose highly localized loss of material. Okay, this point is very important. 
very important for physics and the formulation of the mathematical model. So the bond breakage is diffused. The diffused bond breakage means the diffused loss of stiffness and inertia. The later loss of stiffness and inertia is nothing but the material loss. Material sinks within localized area of volume. <clears throat> In some damage theories, without looking at physics, okay, just phenomenologically, they assume that damage is the loss of stiffness. That's not enough, okay? Inertia should be also lost. I will talk about that. Now let's go to equations. How to describe all this process? Uh, we have to consider coupling. We have to consider two balance laws. First of all, we have to consider momentum balance. Okay, so y is placement. This is the material density. I use here the Lagrangian description referential, so please be careful. All this in the Lagrangian description, uh, these divergences with respect to the coordinates in the referential configuration. This is the first bioelectric of stress. We should use the mass balance law, the mass balance law. So now R, R dot equals div S plus Xi, plus Xi. It should be also equal, equal to zero. I will talk about that. Here, S is the referential mass flux, and here you can see the constitutive law for it. I will discuss in detail constitutive laws. They work, and there is a reason uh, for such choice of the constitutive law. And for the mass sink, we also use this constitutive law. This is the referential mass sink. Rho is the referential mass density, and rho zero is the referential mass density at time t equals zero. Okay, so please be careful. The referential mass density can change, can change. It's not the initial mass density, it is different. Well, this is, uh, these are already subtleties of the, of the um, formulation. Now, this is the constitutive law. It depends now on the mass density, which is an additional variable and can be found from the mass balance equation. We also use the switch parameter to prevent, which is zero one, yeah, to prevent uh, from material healing and unloading. And these are material failure constants. What is important here that we consider mass balance uh, equals zero, okay? Uh, what is the idea? Of course, mass changes and mass density changes, but it changes very fast, okay? So it is constant, constant when we don't have crack. When we have crack, it jumps to zero, say approximately zero, okay? So we have such jumps in the mass density. And then we differentiate it with respect to time, we should introduce delta functions, but we don't consider this process of jumping. You know, the easiest way uh, to understand that is to use analogy. Analogy with the buckling of thin wall structures. We usually consider thin wall structures in the pre-buckle state and post-buckle state. And in both cases, we ignore the inertial forces, okay? So the very process of the transition from the pre-buckle state to the buckle state, we don't consider. Same is true here. We don't consider the rupture of the bones themselves, okay? We consider pre-crack state and post-crack state, okay? So we consider two states without crack and with, uh, with crack. So that's the reason when we can get rid of this R dot on the left-hand side. And we can only consider div S plus Xi, okay? So this gives us the distribution of mass density. So it's a coupled system of equations. These two constants, material failure constants, phi and them, uh, we already discussed when we considered energy limiter. This is the energy limiter. And M is the parameter, which, is, uh, which depends on the a stiffness of the transition to failure. This beta and kappa are two new parameters. I will talk about them. Uh, so we have a couple system of equations. If we substitute this constitutive law for the referential mass sink and referential mass flux into mass balance, <clears throat> then we get this equation. We get this equation. And what is interesting here, 
this is the uh, this is this equation is uh, of the second order in its highest spatial derivatives and it has the small parameter this small parameter is the ratio square root of the ratio of kappa and beta okay so we don't need to know them separately the only thing we need to know is this characteristic length Okay, so what is the mathematical meaning of this equation? This is mass balance. This equation mathematically, because of this small parameter at the highest derivative, introduces solution of the boundary layer type. So we introduce regularized solution of the boundary layer type. So this solution allows to suppress this pathological mesh sensitivity for which standard models of which standard models of damage mechanics are famous okay so it's a uh, so we have physical basis for suppressing mesh sensitivity here i show you simulations uh, which until five did uh, 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 truly amazing but unfortunately i have to completely omit all the simulation all technical part which is very interesting on itself okay because we have to deal with large deformations and large distortions. Specifically, uh, Anshul co didn't consider uh, natural rubber. Instead, he considered a uh, material of angulism. Angulism is a local dilation of artery. Okay, it's a kind of isotropic soft material. Okay, it, it undergoes uh, smaller deformation before, before failure, about 1.5 stage. Okay, so we use this material, it was very interesting. But I don't consider in this talk uh, biological materials. I have a separate talk about biological materials. Okay, um, so we have a boundary layer uh, type solution. I skip. I don't. I also don't show the movie of the track propagation, which is very nice. Uh, Anshul can do that. Um, a very interesting conclusion concerning this simulation. First of all, mass inertia plays the crucial role in the dynamic track propagation. Cracks are narrow when mass sinks and the cracks can unphysically widen when mass is preserved. And this is very interesting. Actually, phase field modelers, this is very fashionable to use the phase field modeling today. They also discovered that, okay. In these two papers, the guys used uh, phase fields and they found that uh, cracks tend to widen with the increasing velocity. The reason for the widening is that they didn't consider, they didn't kill uh, inertia. They didn't consider mass sink. They only considered uh, uh, the loss of material stiffness. That is not enough, period. Then we found that strong or pathological mesh dependence is suppressed by the couple formulation and the fracture energy converges under the mesh refinement. Well, that was expected. That, uh, that was the reason why we needed the coupling, why we needed the mass balance equation to suppress the pathological uh, mesh sensitivity. Does this formulation help in uh, any case? Does it suppress mesh, mesh sensitivity completely? No, no, that is also very surprising and we should uh, further study that. Actually, we found weak, okay, we defined it as weak mesh dependence. That is different crack patterns can occur for different meshes. Well, the reason for that, uh, first of all, I have to tell you that the energy, the dissipated energy in the fracture process is the same, is the same. Though we have different patterns, slightly different patterns. The reason for that might be the numerical inhomogeneity. Okay, analogously, crack patterns can be different for similar specimens and real materials due to the microstructure inhomogeneity. So, you know, numerical procedures, <coughs> they, in a sense, they repeat what happens in nature. <coughs> we can't create ideal, ideal numerical schemes. Okay, like we can't create an ideal specimens, ideal material particles, okay? So that's the reason why we, we can't repeat the uh, fracture patterns. 
we always have the main crack and maybe branching and so on and so forth, but it will be exactly identical, identical crack product. That was a very interesting. Um, uh, and you know, this uh, couple formulation, it doesn't provide, doesn't provide, it's, there is no mathematical proof that it, it provides uniqueness. No, not at all. Uh, very final remarks. First, the approaches described in the present talk are based on two physical observations only. Bond energy is bounded, the first observation, and broken bonds are diffused, the second observation. And based on these observations, it was possible to formulate theories of failure and fracture without introducing any internal variables. So that is, we didn't need damage variables, felts, phase fields, etc. Okay, so it's purely physical, physically based theory. Uh, I thank you, and let me thank all people who participated, who actually did this research that I briefly reviewed today. Uh, Jacob Abudi, uh, uh, Damian Van de Iglesias, Anshul Fire, thank you for having me, Yoav Lev, Polela Mitrovaruni, uh, Jose Rodriguez Martinez, Stefan Rudek, Vyacheslav Slesarenko, and Guadalo Padillo. Uh, we also benefited great, uh, greatly from the uh, financial support of Israel Science Foundation and Israel Ministry of Construction. Before I go to questions, uh, let me advertise something. First of all, we have a new journal, Mechanics of Soft Materials, okay? So if you do, research on soft materials, uh, make the right choice of the journal, okay? Uh, this journal was created to publish papers on soft materials. And also uh, there is a second edition of my book, Mechanics of Soft Materials too. The good thing about this book is it, it is very short, okay? So your chances to go to the end are very high. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. And I'm ready to answer questions. Okay, thank you, Costa. <clears throat> so we are open for question. Uh, I uh, ask audience to please post questions at, at Q&A part, and I'll be relaying it to the Costa. Okay, by the time the audience uh, ask any question, uh, Professor Wallach, I would like to ask a question on that uh, vertical crack uh, which was appearing on uh, tension. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, uh, that uh, that specimen is just under uh, tension and nothing else, and the crack propagated vertically. Uh, yes. Right? Uh, no, no, they, they, they had a notch here. Yeah, they had a notch and then it was under tension. Yes, yes. And, uh, and, and you know, it is interesting. They also tried to interpret this result and they assumed mm -hmm. that there is some intrinsic anisotropy in this material, <laughs> but uh, there isn't. <laughs> I mean, you need somehow to explain. And um, yeah, I think, uh, but we can see it in our analysis, we can see it isotropic material. Okay, so uh, even in isotropic material, um, you can observe such cracks. You can predict, we predict it without knowing that it can be observed. <laughs> yeah. But yes, it, it, it was observed. Very strange, very strange. Yeah, I think there, are, uh, there is a, another question related to that. Uh, I will read the question from Surend the KVN. Okay. Are the parallel cracks to tensile loading possible when normal traction on the prospective crack path would be compressive? Uh, uh, oh, you mean compression in one direction? Yes, of course, but uh, in, in, in the other direction, you'll have tension if it, it was the question. Uh, there is a question. Uh, from Sumit Basu, the value mm -hmm. of energy limiter turns out to be independent of material model, is that? Uh, uh, well, okay, let me go. 
uh, let me go to this formula. Yeah, in pre the, the uh, short answer is yes, but let me explain how. Uh, look, in this formula, what you can do, you have a material model, okay? This is the intact material model, intact behavior. Okay, you substitute it into this function and the material model is already calibrated. And the only thing you should calibrate in this function is this phi. You can, you can put M equals 10. To, to find phi, you need to do some experiment until failure, okay? And from this experiment, you find this phi. That's all. Yeah, it is independent. Okay. Generally, it is independent. Well, it, it is independent. Let me, uh, 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 let me be, let me answer uh, more precisely. Uh, if M, if M is large, say 10, 10 is large. Okay, then they are independent. But if you want a gradual transition to failure, okay, then, and you put M equals one, then indeed, indeed, you should calibrate uh, the material parameters for the intact material behavior and this uh, uh, energy limiter, you should uh, calibrate them simultaneously. Yeah. yeah, and this happens in some materials, in biological materials, for example. Yeah, but if M equals 10, if you have abrupt failure, then yes, they are independent. Yeah. Okay, there is one question from Trisha Sen. Mm -hmm. For the poker chip experiment, uh, recent work by Lopez et al. mentioned an effect of surface strength on the material to be influenced the cavitation phenomena. Uh, 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 please slower. Uh, okay. Poker chip test. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. So, uh -huh. uh, a recent work by Lopez mentioned an effect of surface strength on of the failure to be influencing the cavitation phenomena. Is your energy limiter has some connection to that? Uh, we, we, what, what effect? Uh, say it again. Surface please. strength. Effect of surface strength. Self resistance? Surface strength. Uh, what's, um, what's yeah, strength? Maybe you can, uh, you can read the questions at QA. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, at on, the, the on, on the chart. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, on the bottom, okay. you would see Q&A part. Uh, I'm sure maybe, ah, on the bottom? Yeah. Uh, uh, pocket chip test written, uh, how much and which brand is applied for a person? Anshul, maybe you can. Uh, I, 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 uh, I can't understand. Can ask the question directly. Okay, I will yes, uh, yes, probably yes. allow the Please. user to ask. Yeah, sure. This is the best yeah, way. Yeah. 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 So, Trisha, I have allowed you to ask the question. You may speak. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Volak. And thank you, Anshul. So, uh, Dr. Volak, uh, mm -hmm. I was recently attending a conference where um, uh, Dr. Oscar Lopez Pamis from mm -hmm. uh, Arbona Champaign, he was explaining the poker mm -hmm. chip experiment and he was mentioning that the cavitation initiation in the poker chip experiment is supposed to be dominated by the surface strength of the material, which he's, he's explaining somewhat like a configurational force or something. I exactly don't remember the terminology. And I was seeing when you were explaining your energy limiter, it has a, a unit of strength like like just MPA, right? So I was thinking, do are is there any relation with? The... No, no. no? I, I I will I will tell you more even. Uh, well, first of all, there are various explanations of uh, same phenomena. I don't mm -hmm. think that uh, surface tension plays any role. And, um, and my, my uh, explanation is not related to surface tension. Okay, this is the, just the fact, the energy limiter says that the, in the given, uh, in the given uh, elementary volume, the energy that you can accumulate is finite. It is finite. And this is the energy limiter. It uh, imposes this bound on the development of the energy. 
but there are various, I don't think that the surface tension uh, plays significant role in solids. In fluids, yes, in fluids, definitely. But in solids, I don't know, maybe on the nanoscale, uh, it, it, might, uh, it might be important, but um, I don't think it is. Costa, uh, uh, if I may add to yes, this, uh, we, have, we, we have done some simulations using surface tension and uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, surface elasticity. Uh, mm -hmm. They would play a role, as Costa said, probably uh, at micrometers, not mm -hmm. nanometers, in very mm -hmm. soft materials, materials with, mm -hmm. uh, with bulk stiffnesses of, or, of the order of uh, a few kilopascals only. So oh, okay. beyond that, I don't think uh, surface tension has anything to do uh, in the experiments of GENT. And that's the one that Costa was basically concentrating on. Yes. So I, I, I don't see the role of surface tension. They would just be just be minuscule compared to uh, the bulk, bulk uh, stresses. Absolutely, I agree completely. And I'll tell you more, this soft material it is almost it is almost a liquid. In liquids, surface tension is of importance, no doubt about that. But uh, in solids, even so relatively soft solids, I mean, uh, in models, yeah, they, they, they can help you to explain something about instability, but physically, I don't think uh, they play any role. And moreover, actually, once I had a discussion in my mechanic about that, I think that in liquids, why surface tension is so important? Because uh, the re there are more molecular bonds on the surface, okay? The uh, liquid molecules are much stronger bonded on the surface. In the case of solids, this is just the opposite, okay? In the bulk, they are bonded. And on the surface, they are less bonded, okay? So that's the reason, in my opinion, uh, surface tension doesn't play any role in solids. Also, this question is related. It is quite often asked about fracture process. And this term surface tension is uh, very often used when people talk about fracture. I think it is uh, completely pointless. I, I don't think it, uh, surface tension has any anything to do with fracture. But it's, uh, it's my opinion. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. I Sorry, sorry to interrupt. So I, I was not saying about surface tension specifically, but more on the light. I think if I understood uh, the earlier work that I was referring to was in the, basically you need uh, energy to create free surfaces when the cavitation happens. I guess it was related to that, that the strength required to form free surfaces has, a, has an influence. Uh, I was trying to relate to that. But anyway, I have another question so related to this. So your energy limiter is essentially going to explain the initiation for the cracking right. phenomena, right? Yes. Does it, yes. Does it uh, also explain in the same, same, same light, specifically if you couple with the mass uh, diffusion part, uh, for the propagation phenomena as well? Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay. Look, uh, this is what I forgot to tell you. Okay, it was written. In the case of homogeneous deformation, the considered laws uh, uh, oh, yeah. uh, yes. reduced to hyperelasticity. So it's a generalization. But, and this is interesting, you don't always need to use the most general theory. It, everything depends on what answer you are trying uh, to consider, what, what answer are you looking for? And uh, what question you're uh, trying to consider? You don't always need the most general theory, okay? So if you consider failure as the onset of damage, you it's enough to use limiters. But if you would like to see cracks, how they propagate, then you should consider the coupled, uh, the coupled uh, system of equations. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. 
Go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, so this is uh, uh, Animangshu uh, from IIT mm -hmm. Kanpur. So uh, I wanted to ask you uh, one question about uh, this Alan Jens experiment. So as far as I remember, this in Jens experiment, this um, this uh, the thickness of this uh, rubber layer between these two uh, this mm -hmm. uh, steel plates. Okay. They these are varied. So I mean, he used this uh, different uh, rubber layer of different thicknesses. And therefore, this uh, cavitation number of these cavities, which also varied with this thickness. So, uh, will you call, will you make any comment on that? I mean, the, uh, on, on based on the theory that you developed, that how that may be happening? Uh, well, no, I didn't consider exactly. We didn't simulate exactly the, the experiment. Okay, I only considered an idealized case, as as uh, Jen did. Okay, this is a very small, very small initial void. Uh, and this is the continuum, three-dimensional continuum with remote, with remote hydrostatic tension. So it's an axisymmetric problem, which has the analytical solution. But you say, if we can exactly simulate the pocket chip test, we didn't do that. Okay? We only assume that during, during this test, we have the hydrostatic tension. And um, well, I think that the degree to which we have the hydrostatic idealized hydrostatic tension should depend also on the thickness of the of the specimen of course of course and uh, please pay attention that you don't have the hydrostatic tension exactly here at the edge okay so yes uh, generally it might depend it might depend but um, we didn't do simulation of the test itself we only did uh, look the fact that you have a lot of cavities, it says that the state is uh, inhomogeneous, okay? And uh, you should know the structure, specific structure of material and the placement of the cavities. So you can, you can consider such problem. You can put initial very small cavities uh, distributed, uh, I don't know, in space and try to make the calculations. I think also it might depend on the specimen itself, not on the loading condition. So maybe in one specimen, there were more initial cavities, okay? And in the other specimen, less, less cavities. So yeah, it is, uh, it is very uh, experiment dependent. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. And I have another question about uh, that uh, mm -hmm. track propagating parallel to the uh, direction okay. of uh, application of load okay. uh, in that particular you know, experiment uh, or like, you know, the theory. So is it, uh, is it fair to say that the uh, stress concentration ahead of the, uh, the notch, okay, that gets somewhat um, decreased. Okay, and uh, you know, the crack propagates, uh, uh, the, the crack that uh, the side crack Okay, that uh, starts uh, uh, propagating pa parallel to the pa direction of application of the load. I mean, is it fair to say that the stress concentration ahead of the notch that was made, I know that gets decreased uh, somehow. I mean, like, uh, uh, so the crack that uh, that occurs parallel to the uh, uh, direction of load, uh, that can propagate. I mean, is, is that is that way to see, you can see? Uh, well, if I understood you correctly, what you say is the, what is the importance of the initial notch on the, right. yeah. on the direction of the, well, first of all, even in the presence of the notch, because it gives the initiation of the crack, uh, I would expect the horizontal crack right. as anybody else, <laughs> okay? But we, we got the crack parallel to the direction of tension. That is amazing. I mean, of course, of course, it's not the ideal, ideal uniaxial tension because we have the stress concentration. Uh -huh. Of course, that's true. Right. But the very fact that crack doesn't run this way horizontally and it goes vertically. That's amazing. That's amazing. Very, very, very no, strange. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Maybe one last question from uh, Professor uh, Kerala Verma. Uh, so, Professor Sham, uh, I have allowed you to speak. Please, you may ask the question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, my question had to do with the energy limiter model. So, it was not clear to me like what introduces the length scale in that model. So, if if you do a fracture simulation oh, okay, using that okay. model, okay. Okay. would you get mesh independent results? Or? 
Okay, uh, now, now look, uh, this is the equation. So what we do, first of all, where, where, where does it come from, the length scale? When you substitute in this mass balance, you substitute the mass flux and the referential mass sink, you get this equation. Now look, if you have in this equation, you have the second derivative, the second derivative of, okay. of the mass density with respect to spatial coordinates. So if you have second derivative with respect to spatial coordinates, you have always, you have to have some coefficient of, of the length dimension, okay? And this coefficient, it comes from, from this pressure. So here it is unavoidable. I mean, don't think even about the dimensions of all parameters here, okay? If you have spatial derivative, then you have to multiply it. You have to multiply it by the length. If you have the second spatial derivative, you have twice multiplied by length. Otherwise, it will be inconsistent equation. Okay, so it automatically comes out of that. And that's the idea actually of all, uh, of all regularization methods. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, that was my question. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, thank you. So maybe other questions can be uh, directed to uh, Professor Wolok through email or something? And yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I will be happy to answer. And also, since since you recorded it, you can see here uh, uh, on the bottom, we always have the uh, uh, the reference. So you can look through the reference. I can I can send it to you. Um, yeah, so you can you can see the details. Mm, uh, in this talk, I, I gave you the already published results. All results were already published. Okay, so thank you. Uh, thank you. We end the semi uh, today's seminar now. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Costa. Thank um, you. Thank yeah, you. Take care. Uh, we will we will close the meeting right now. Mm, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Anshul. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Most you, Costa. Pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah. See you. Yeah, see you. I, I'm ending the meeting now. Okay.